credit stack like a pro this is going to be the business edition and so what is our talk for today you're going to be learning what business credit stacking actually is now the reason why i'm using the term credit stacking is because that is essentially what's it's kind of been coined by not necessarily the industry and in, in the financial world, but more so just people as a whole, especially on social media. So not to get too lost into the weeds of what the terminology is so that we're using that term. It's going to be credit stacking just because it's one that the majority of us are probably already familiar with. And so the different levels of business credit stacking, we're going to take you from beginner to what a pro framework looks like. Funding frameworks and funding sequences, what the heck is that and how you can implement that into your business so that you can continue to get access to working capital that you can continue to scale with. How to properly set up your business funding for scale. Now, there's a specific way that you want to set this up because you don't want to scale too, too quickly because if not, you actually end up hurting yourself in the long run. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but... You'll see what I mean when we start diving into that part and then some costly mistakes that you should avoid along the way. And so with that in mind, let's just go ahead and break down what exactly is credit card stacking. You've maybe seen it online. You've maybe been browsing through YouTube. You've maybe been looking at different ways that you can, you know, different methods that you can use to maybe fund your business. And so a really simple, clean definition that I came up with is this is the process of submitting multiple credit card applications in a specific order with multiple banks in order to access large amounts of unsecured capital. That's all that is. Now, that is a bare bones basic way of credit stacking. Now, throughout the training, you're going to see me break down, hey, this is a way that you can possibly credit stack with a business on a credit, even though it's a bit more advanced. Or you can just stick to, again, bare bones credit cards. Nothing wrong with that, especially if you're just starting out. But here's a typical business credit card stacking layout. You have bank A, you get approved for a 0% business credit card. You have bank B, or you apply at bank B, you get approved for a 0% business credit card. You apply at bank C, and you get approved for a, drum roll please, a 0% business credit card. We're not trying to overcomplicate it. We're trying to keep it as simple as possible. Now, in terms of levels to credit, card, to, to credit card stacking, there are levels to this. It's not just, hey, there's just, you know, this is the only option that you're going to have, which is 0% business credit cards. I believe everyone starts somewhere. And so if you're a complete startup, this is a nice way, right, of kind of dipping your toes and getting access to that first $15,000 business credit line, $20,000 business credit line. But as you, as you start to scale, you want to eventually venture out into different types of funding products like your term loans or your business lines of credit or even your vehicle type of funding. But with that in mind, I'm going to give you, again, a soft approach or a basic approach, I should say, on what a beginner or entry level 0% uh, business credit card stacking model looks like. And so here's a real world example of this. This is just going to be one product. So one zero percent business credit card at a bank or a credit union. So whatever you see throughout this bank, credit union, fin financial institution, it's essentially the same thing. We're just using it inter interchangeably depending on which route you want it to go to, whether it's a bank or a credit union. So with that in mind, an example of this, it's a $30,000 zero percent business credit card at financial, financial institution A, a $30,000 0% business credit card at financial institution B. So the total for this, it's a $60,000 credit stack. Because keep in mind, the math is you got 30K at one bank and then you got 30K at the second bank. Now that's the beginner level. Here's a bit more of a novice level where you have multiple products from each institution. And it breaks down something like this. You have two $25,000 0% business credit cards at financial institution A or at bank A or a credit union A. Remember, it's all the same thing. You have two $25,000 or you have two $25,000 0% business credit cards at financial institution B. So the grand total from that would be $100,000 in business capital. Again, just the business credit cards. We're not trying to get too fancy just yet. That's 50K from each bank or each financial institution. Now, 
most people, especially when you're starting out, this is going to work just fine. Now, obviously, there's some nuance to this, which we're going to dive into of how you want to be set up. But most people, depending on maybe the line of work that you do, if it's e-commerce or if you're just using some of the capital to maybe fund your projects, unless it's things like payroll or actually using some of those funds for maybe a real estate deal, that's when you would have to venture in more into term loans or into working capital like business house of credit. This is going to work for most people, especially if you just need to get access to supplies or if you're running ads, then of course you could just go ahead and put that on a 0% business credit card. Now, this right here is going to be a bit more advanced. Now, I know that I have on here credit card stack, but this is where you start to venture in into adding layers to the funding plan that you have. And so this is one that we typically like to use with our clients and we help them set up inside of the inside inner circle. And it looks something like this. Again, keep in mind, this is a little bit more advanced, a 0% business credit card, but now you're introducing a business line of credit from each institution. And so the example of this is going to be two dollars 25,000% business credit cards, $150,000 business line of credit at financial institution A. So we're still in the same spot, but we've essentially now used three products from the same source. You tracking so far? Okay. One twenty thousand dollar zero percent business credit card and one thirty thousand dollar business out of credit at financial institution B. So this right here is going to be three at the first place and then two at the second place. Because remember, you have one business out of credit and then one uh, one business line of credit and one business credit card at financial institution B. So the total for this is going to be $150,000. That's $100,000 from A and fifty dollars from B. Now, the cool thing about this framework right here is that you can use some of that working capital to invest into things like real estate, which a lot of our clients typically do. You can't use that or you can't do that necessarily if you have a business credit card. Now, I know that some people out there, they talk about possibly you know, using the card and finding different ways that you can take some of the, I say capital or some of the credit line off of the business credit card. Look, I mean, at scale, that stuff just gets flagged. And so if you're looking to fund your, your business the right way, we always recommend our clients just because we've seen it fail more often. We've seen more horror stories than anything else. And you want to do it right, especially when you're scaling this thing is you want to use each product for what it's intended for. So the business line of credit is what you use as real cash value stuff where you can essentially take money from that account that gets deposited from that business line of credit, essentially what it is. And you can use that toward a down payment of a property. You can use that to cover escrow. You can use that uh, toward, uh, to, to maybe cover payroll. Now with the business credit card, that's where you would use maybe to cover your ad spend, right? Because you can carry some of that balance, especially if it's 0% interest for 12 to 18 months on average, depending on the bank that you decide to go with, that's where you would use that specific product. But again, keep in mind, and I don't want to harp on this for too long, but I do see people get caught up and let me just, you know, get access to business credit cards. I can try to get, they call it liquidating. I can try to liquidate that off. And that ends up being a recipe for disaster on the back end, especially when you start to scale. There's nothing worse than getting blacklisted by a financial institution which puts you in a really tough situation, especially when you have, especially when you're, when you're in a spot where you have pretty big expenses coming in. And again, you're also looking to grow your income and you have a sweet spot, but now you have no capital that you can turn to because you kind of screwed it up. So that is my fair warning to you. Now, funding frameworks, you guys probably hear me talk about this. If you've visited the channel at some time, or if you've been watching our content for some time, if you're an OG, then You've maybe heard me say this before, but if not, hopefully you appreciate uh, kind of like the quick review on this. And this is how you structure your funding for any given round. And so frameworks are going to be specific to the business's geographic location. So this is where the business is operating. It's going to be specific to the financials of that business. So this is going to be either projections or actual figures. Now, Irv, you know, what's the difference? Projections actual figures. Well, sometimes you, you know, I'll give you two scenarios. Sometimes we'll be working with a client and that client is a complete startup. There's no actual figures. There's no cash flow coming in. There's no 
um, tax returns that we can turn to. There's no PL. They're, they're brand spanking new, right? We just helped them set everything up. Totally fine. At that point, we're gonna be we're gonna be working off of the projections. Get this, based off of how the business is established and based off of the line of work and industry that the business is involved in. That's that's a, that's a key point right there because you don't just want to use projections that again you see online because you could be selling yourself short. I see this all the time, especially in the comments. People say, you know, how much should I put on a business credit card application? Well, I have no context on the situation. So if I tell someone or if like you see online and somebody says, hey, just put 400K on a business credit card application. If you're in an industry where that's pennies, then you're actually uh, undercutting yourself, which sends a red flag to the financial institution of, hey, maybe this business isn't, isn't they don't necessarily know what they're actually doing because the projections are off based off of the averages for that business and where they're located geographically. The other side of it is you could be exaggerating the numbers because let's say if you do, um, in, let's say an industry like consulting, it's, it's, uh, we, we call it very, it's very generic. What type of consulting is it, right? Is it uh, personal consulting? Is it fitness consulting? Is it construction consulting? Is it media consulting? Is it, you know, the list goes on. Is it uh, brand awareness consulting? Like what type of consulting is it? Because there's subsectors of that and in, in, inside of the consulting space or inside of the consulting industry. And so now you could be overshooting. And again, it sends a red flag to the bank of this particular business is just fishing for credit. Now with actual figures, that's pretty self-explanatory. That's when you already possibly already have your P&Ls set up that you can go off of. You already have your tax returns, maybe the last two years or three years plus. At that point, you maybe have your financial statements. You already have bank statements that you can use. I just wanted to give you a, a generic baseline of when we say financials and when you're setting up a funding framework for your business, which is what we help our clients do. We install that into their business. This is what you want to look at because if not, then you're leaving not just one, a lot of money on the table, but you're also uh, hurting yourself and set, hurting yourself instead of setting yourself for success when you plan to scale your working capital. Industry is the next one that you have to look at, which is the line of work. So this is how the business is classified. That's going to that's gonna determine a big piece of not just how much funding you get, but the back end of that is if you get denied altogether because some banks don't want to touch certain industry that's called, it's, it's known as a lending appetite. There's probably a little to no type of industry. That, let's say if you bring a trucking, that's a popular one right now. You bring trucking and they have little to no trucking um, clients that they're approving for inside of their lending portfolio, then at that point, it doesn't matter if you have the best business model in the world, they're just not touching the file. And so you want to go where the money's at and where the money is flowing for your business and for your industry. Credit profile, this is going to be both on the personal and on the business side. No thin files, meaning you want to have it properly set up. No, no less than five credit pro, uh, no less than five accounts on the personal side if you really want to get as much squeeze as you can in your funding round. And then your entity setup, this is going to be either your LLC, S Corp, or C Corp. Try to stay away from sole props because what ends up happening later on is you'll have to either close out the accounts that you have or you'll have to switch over into the LLC or into the S Corp, which by the way, it's, it's a better model anyways, especially if you're building a legit business. And you can't carry that credit with you in most instances, right? There is some workaround, but kind of bet on you not being able to carry it with you, which is what I see more often than not. So you essentially end up starting from zero because the EIN, you have to get a brand spec into EIN when you transition into an LLC because now the business is seen as a disregarded entity. Doesn't necessarily happen that way with a sole prop. So one last thought here is a uh, funding frameworks are not going to be a one size fits all. Since no two business, since no two businesses are identical, and so the way that you would fund, let's say, one LLC is not the same way that you're going to fund another LLC, especially if they're two different types of businesses. So if you have one LLC, it's real estate, and then you have another LLC, it's just media. Those are going to re require two different game plans and two different frameworks. Keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to the funding sequence, your funding sequence, this is going to be the cadence or the timeline of how you go through your funding frameworks. So keep in mind, your funding frameworks are going to be kind of like the banks that you go to and how the business is set up.
the funding sequence is going to be the timeline of when you're executing everything. So an example is let's say that you plan on getting seventy-five dollars to $125,000 in business credit. Then you're probably going to do that again, given on, on this, you know, obviously we're, we're kind of going generic here, but let's say it's a brand new business, less than a year old. That's probably going to take you 90 to about 120 days, which is, you could maybe do it in one round, but most likely two rounds, especially if you want to do it right now, obviously if your business is over four years, your cash flow positive, strong credit profile, then, I mean, you can bang out a six figure funding round, gosh, within the first 30 days. Right. You don't you don't have to stretch it out to 90, 120 days. I'm just giving you a baseline. Remember, it's case by case. And so this is what allows you to properly scale your working capital the right way when you space it out. So a lot of questions that I get and I want to answer here is really one of the main questions that I get, I should say, is when should you set up multiple sequences? Like Irv, if I have, let's say, 90 days, like, is there something that comes after that? You know, can I go again? 180 days out, you know, three, the first three months, I got some funding. Can I go again? 180 days out. Can I go again? Five months out. You know, how does that work? I want to give you two baseline metrics that you want to look at. The first one is kind of obvious, right? If you need more money, then odds are you're going to need more than one funding round, or in this case, a funding sequence, right? And so whatever you get in the first, let's say 60 to 90 days, as you're going through that first round, you're going to add up the totals and you're going to say, okay, this is enough capital that I can use to deploy back into my business. I'm good. Or, or you're going to say we're halfway there. So let's say I got access to 80,000, but my project is going to eat up about 60 K on that. So I know that I need to come up with another 75 K Then at that point, 100%, you're going back into a second round, which in this case, the sequence continues. Now, the second thing or the second uh, kind of like baseline metric that I want you to look at is if you have multiple business entities or multiple business ventures. So if you have more than one business in layman terms, that's what that is. And so again, if you have a business that is in real estate, 70 K that you're going to use is going to be just for your real estate projects. But then you have another business that you just need 50,000, but you don't want to touch the money that it's maybe already counted for on the 70 K side. And the other businesses, maybe you do consulting, and you need another 60K for that, then at that point, you're going to set up two different sequences. First sequence is going to be for real estate. And then the second sequence is going to be for consulting. Now, bringing this all together, I do want to give you some best practices of what you should watch out for when you're going through your rounds of funding. First one is one that I don't see talked about enough. And I want to bring awareness to this. Scaling can be fun. You know, when, whenever you hear someone talking about scale, it sounds fun because there's more money, there's more employees, there's more revenue coming in, uh, there's more locations that we're opening up, we're picking up more projects. But if you run a, a legit business and you know, sometimes if you scale too quickly, you can end up hurting yourself because it doesn't have enough infrastructure to support the new weight that's being essentially mounted on to the uh, to the system. And so I say that to say, don't scale the capital too quickly, especially if you start seeing some wins. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but sometimes, you know, we'll see a client where they'll come in and, you know, we'll help them get to that first target. So for them, and this is just an example, right? Let's say $175,000 and immediately they, they say, well, let's double that up. We have to lay it out properly so that as you go in, for that second round, you don't end up slashing your first, uh, your, your first approvals in half. That happens quite a bit. Banks catch on to this where they say, why are they trying to what they call double dip? Why are they double dipping so quickly? We already gave them access to capital. And so you want to set systems in place to where there's some organic spend happening and you're naturally nurturing that, that partnership with the bank so that as you start coming in for that second, third, fourth round, right? And you start opening yourself up to multiple products, you don't burn yourself from the initial uh, funding uh, approvals that you got. That's the first thing. Second pitfall that you want to avoid, it kind of ties into scaling too quickly, is applying for too many credit lines too quickly. Really, I see this more with people that don't have a plan. And so like their, their approach is, let me just see what's on YouTube or let me just see what's online and just submit a bunch of applications and pray to God that something sticks. 
that ends up hurting people in the long run. And I don't want that to happen to you if you're watching this video, because if you get, here's like a baseline metric you, go, you should watch. If you submit four applications, you should be getting three out of four approvals. Best, you know, best case scenario, four out of four approvals. If you submit, let's say four banking applications and you got one approval, you hit two denials and then you get one that's pending. I tell clients, especially the ones that we're kind of helping them audit that and, and get that reversed when we first start working with them, put a pause on your file and see why you're getting denied. And most often, more often than not, it's the institutions they're going to either don't want to test their industry or their business is just, just jacked up from a, from a sense of how they're set up all together. And so you want to aim for no less than 90% approvals whenever you're submitting these applications. Right now, on average, last time we checked, it's about 30, 35. That's across the board between most banks. So for every, let's say, three applications that go in, one gets approved. At scale, you can see how that's very uh, ineffective and it's and it's inefficient, I should say. Next up is applying with a weak or a thin file. This is both on the personal and on the business side. Now, this is going to be, again, your personal credit and your business credit, meaning you want to have that intact. And so if you have one too many collections, not a good time to apply. If you have, let's say, too many late payments, not a good time to apply unless you're getting this stuff removed. If your score is anything less than a 680, most likely not a good time to apply. I'm just, I'm just going to give it to you straight, right? None of this EIN only stuff. I know that you probably hear about that. Look, for the type of capital that you're probably thinking about, which is real cash value credit, you're going to end up personally guaranteeing, which means that your personal credit is going to be in use, which means that your personal personal credit has to be intact. So have some accounts on there, have some age on there. And then when it comes to the business side, banks are no longer just looking at the personal score, even though that's going to be you know, a predominant factor. They're also taking a look at the business side, your business credit profile. And so with your business credit profile being in place, they call that a dual score. SBA does this quite a bit. If you ever venture into the SBA world, they'll look at both the personal and the business side. And so banks and financial institutions are starting to do this more and more now with that dual score. And so have both in place so that way you can maximize the amount of wins that you get. Not executing the funding in the correct order. Again, the possible applications are out of order. The banks that we go to are out of order. You maybe went to a T or A bank first, which is like a chase when you should have gone to maybe a credit union first. There's a time and a place of, you know, of how you want to set it up. And so it depends, again, on the type of products that you're going for. Filling out the credit application incorrectly, that's pretty self-explanatory. Attempting with an improper business setup, this happens, again, quite a bit. Take a look at your name. Is your name spelled properly? I'm, I'm talking about basic stuff, guys. Is your name spelled properly? Your personal name, the owner's name, is the business address set up properly? Is the owner's address set up properly? The business phone line, the website, taking a look at everything. A quick place that you can check for this is take a look at your business credit profiles. Your business credit profiles is going to be one of the first sources that, that the financial institutions are going to pull from. And so if information is out of whack there, Get that dialed in first. That's a quick little pro tip before you even think about submitting any type of any type of funding, because if that's out of whack, when it enters into their system, it's going to get flagged as mismatch information. Attempting with an improper business setup, we just finished mentioning banks or lending institutions that don't have a lending appetite for your industry. We kind of hit on that earlier. But again, if you talk to a business banker, you ask them, hey, look, I'm involved in trucking. When's the last time you guys maybe funded someone in my space? Or are you guys pulling away from it? Because high risk, here's a little pro tip for you as well. Like a little, a little, um, what I call a little piece of gold. High risk industries don't always get you denied. I know that people misconstrue that of stay away from high risk, stay from stay away from high risk. No, no, no. You can get approved with a high risk industry. You can get approved with the low risk industry. What you don't want to do is be involved in a restricted industry. That's complete red tape. Yellow tape is going to be a high risk industry, which means they're going to proceed with caution. Now, there's two senses for high risk in the way in, in the way that the bank mitigates their risk. The first way is going to be they flat out don't touch the business as a whole for whatever reason. That's their choice. And so at that point, you're just going to get automatically denied or it's going to be crap limits, just calling it what it is. The second type of high risk is going to be if on a macro level, an industry as a whole has taken a hit, even though maybe the economy 
is still pretty strong. At that point, they're going to move away from that industry at least for a little bit until it kind of clears up. And then sometimes they'll segue back into it. That's why timing is freaking crucial because you can have, again, the right business, have the cash flow, but the lending institution that you're going to just flat out doesn't want to touch your file. And at that point, you have to go, you know, if, if in terms of we're talking about fishing, you have to go look at a different pond to fish out of. That's just what needs to be done. There's no, there's no point of forcing it. You can always come back later. But for right now, you got to prioritize your business. And then lastly, submitting mismatching information on multiple applications and banks. This is a little bit different from what I mentioned earlier with looking at your business credit profile. This is more so with if you have a business that you go in and when it asks for revenues, you put on there at one bank, 195000 You'll go to the second bank, you put 460000 and you go to the third bank and you put 204000 right? You can see how that's mismatching. It's all flooding into the same database. So when they go to pretty much scrub that data, they're going to say, wait a minute, there's something that's not congruent here. And so as you're going through your, you know, as you're going through your funding, through your funding rounds, keep that in mind. Use figures that number one, are true to your business. And number two, that are going to be congruent across the board. So that is essentially it when it comes to credit card stacking. And I wanted to take it a step further and just credit stack as a whole, introducing some business signs of credit in there as well. It's one of the things that we do with our clients here at the Inside Inner Circle. We essentially build out these funding models for them. We install them into their businesses so that they can not just get access to working capital, but they continue to scale. So hopefully you found this training worthwhile. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Consider hitting the subscribe button down below if you found value in it. Other than that, I appreciate you guys checking me out. Until next time, everyone, I will see you in the next video. Bye.